So I'm joined by none other than David Solomon, president and co-CEO of Goldman Sachs. Your event right here, right now. Some of the biggest CEOs in tech, you've got Qualcomm, we've had the likes of Twitter even coming, Oracle. What are CEOs in the technology industry telling you right now? Net positive, net negative? Uh, look, there's a lot of optimism. When you're out here in San Francisco and you're dealing with this tech community, there's an awful lot of optimism. And the optimism comes from the fact that a lot of these companies are having a really significant impact on businesses, industries, a lot of change, a lot of disruption, and a lot of growth. And so this is certainly a place and a part of the economy where there's really significant growth. And growth generally leads to optimism. And so when you're out here, sure, there's a lot going on in the world in different ways, but as you're talking to companies in the tech sector, because of the growth that's available in that space, you tend to get you know, a more optimistic view than you might in certain other slices of the economy. As that growth perpetuates, are they wanting to seize the opportunity to start coming to the public markets? Everyone's very hopeful with the Snap IPO being lined up, some part maybe in the first quarter. Will the doors open wide? Will we see the rest of the tech community in the private sector come to the public markets? Well, there's, there's certainly lots of capital available for companies that are growing, and obviously tech companies growing, there's a good amount of capital available. A lot of that capital is available privately, away yeah. from the public market. Last year certainly was a historically low year in terms of IPO activity, and I'm a big believer that these things kind of ebb and flow, but ultimately gravitate back to means. So, you know, we're hopeful and optimistic that we're going to see more IPO activity this year. But I think when you look at the world that a lot of these companies operate in, if they're able to run their businesses and they're able to grow and they're able to access capital privately and there aren't other pressures from shareholders or venture capitalists, you know, these companies are putting off the opportunity to come to the public markets longer. And the reason they can is because the capital for growth is available privately. So I would expect to see more companies coming back to the public markets than we saw last year, but I think that process is going to continue to be you know, a very thoughtful, methodical process for a lot of these companies as they're growing. As you say, ebb and flow, we saw plenty of consolidation in M&A perhaps while the cash balances were heavy. We might see yet more cash come if we see money come from abroad back into the United States. Are you expecting consolidation M&A to be high for 2017? Well, M&A activity, especially in the tech space, is pretty active right now. In fact, uh, we've been involved in, I think, 14 M&A transactions in the TMT space since the first of the year. Yeah. And that, in that six-week period, I think that's more than we've seen in a comparable six-week period. I think you'd have to go back to the year 2000 or you know, the late 90s to see that kind of activity around TMT-related uh, activity. I think there are a number of reasons why that's occurring. You know, one of the things that's definitely happening here is you've got a number of very, very large companies that are growing very, very quickly. You know, Facebook last year grew over 50% on a $28 billion revenue base. Amazon grew, I think, 27% on a $130 billion revenue base. As those companies are growing, they're generating cash, they're generating market cap, but they're also taking away revenues in some way from some other businesses. They're disrupting to some degree. And that puts some of these other businesses in a place where they've got to think about their strategic options more carefully. So I think, broadly speaking, we're going to continue to see consolidation in the tech space. And you know, I think activities will continue, activity levels will continue to be high this year. If yeah. the environment stays you know, the way it is now, I think it could be a relatively good M&A year in the TMT space. Let's talk about disruption. Let's talk about fintech and potentially how Goldman Sachs itself is evolving. Lloyd Blankfein himself said, well, back in 2015 on a podcast, Goldman Sachs is a technology company. How are you adapting? Are you having to hire far more technologists, far more engineers rather than bankers at the moment? Um, we, we clearly, like everyone, are using technology in our business much more than we would have 10, 15 years ago. You can look, I mean, it's very easy to go back and look at the equity trading business. If you go back 15 years, the way people traded equities is, was voice to voice, you know, person to person. And now, obviously, through a vast system of connectivity, you know, people trade equities, generally speaking, electronically. Um, and so that's a massive shift, obviously, in the staff that you need, the people that you need, the systems you need, the support that you need. That's going on in most aspects of the business. The firm itself obviously adapts to those environments, and we hire all different kinds of people. We have a very, very diverse workforce, and we obviously need different kinds of talent. We have increased the number of STEM graduates that we're hiring, because obviously there's more engineering work, more coding work, and as we look to make technology investments that can really lever our ability to serve our clients, we need more of those kinds of people. I wouldn't say it's more of those people versus finance majors or other people that come from more of a business background, but it's a diverse group of people that put us in the best position to service our clients. And as you and I discussed before we came on, 
the quality of our people and our ability to attract great people to really differentiate the firm is really, really important to our overall business. You helped drive a lot of innovation back in the investment banking unit. Do you, does your culture have to change to attract these people in? Do they want more parental leave? Do they want more holiday? Do they want more flexible working? I, 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 don't, I don't think, it's, I don't think it's, it's fundamentally different. Young people today coming into the workforce want to work for a great organization with terrific people that serves clients, has business purpose, um, gives them the opportunity to learn, grow, and really excel. And so we've always been focused on creating the best work environment for a long-term growth, positive experience, economic reward you know, for our employees. We believe if we do that, it's good for our shareholders, it's good for our clients, and it's a very positive cycle for Goldman Sachs. You've got into digital lending. We've got Marcus, which is servicing the consumer base. How is growth there? Um, you know, that's a new business for us and a new platform that we've started. We think we're in an interesting position. We're given our balance sheet and our funding, but without the legacy history that a number of the other, you know, commercial banking competitors have, that we're in a position where we can deliver a really tailored technology product to clients. We have a very targeted universe that we're going after. Um, we think we've got an interesting product and we're excited about the growth opportunity in that business. But it's new, but so far, you know, it's off to a good start and we're excited about the opportunity that, that, that that's presenting. Let's talk about something that potentially a lot of people at Goldman Sachs are excited about right now and it's the share price. Record high. I'm looking at potentially though the ways in which is driving this stock price. Many feeling regulation changes to come, the new administration. What is your wish list in terms of regulatory environment changes for Goldman Sachs? Um, well, look, we operate in the environment that we have to operate in, and we try to be very adaptable, and we try to risk manage for almost any scenario. When there was massive regulatory change after the financial crisis, a lot of that regulation came with a purpose of creating safety and soundness in the system. And that's a really positive thing. But because it happened very quickly, there are a number of rules or a number of things that have happened that have an impact on certain parts of the functioning of the banking system or markets or the economy that with the hindsight now, you know, eight or nine years later, you'd look at and say, well, that's not optimal. Are the things we can do that improve lending, especially to small businesses and mid-sized businesses where there's growth? Are the things that we can do that improve market liquidity? And so, you know, we're in a position where we think it's a great opportunity to revisit some of these things to optimize the overall solution for everyone without in any way affecting safety and soundness of the system. So you don't think it could breed too much risk taking once again? I, 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 I think that a responsible and thoughtful discussion around trying to optimize markets, access to liquidity, lending, especially for small and mid-sized businesses where there's a lot of growth, taking a look at rules where maybe in hindsight, you know, you may want to operate differently. And so, you know, sure, we're, we're focused on those things, but certainly not at the expense of safety and soundness in the system. Let's talk about the Goldman guys and the Goldman girls that are now in a closer proximity to the administration. We've seen, I mean, Nushin just being n named, of course. We've got Cohen, who you have now take, helped take the role of uh, as co-CEO. O'Hare Powell, so that there are a number of Goldman executives now surrounding the administration. Is this a positive thing long term for Goldman Sachs? Because there are some concerns being raised. Well, we've always had a culture of public service inside Goldman Sachs, and I think that's something that we're very proud of. Uh, people have an opportunity to work at Goldman Sachs. They, if they're successful, they do well, and they want to give back, you know, to society, to the community. And so, there's always been a great culture of public service at Goldman Sachs. You know, there's, there's this view that when people leave Goldman Sachs and they go to Washington in some way, shape or form, there's a lot of talk about, you know, that connectivity. But I'll just tell you, it's almost the opposite. You know, these people have their own reputations and they want to, in any way, shape they can, prove that they're doing the right thing for the country, they want to serve. And so to a degree, they're almost more careful the other way with respect to their connectivity. So look, do I think it's a good thing for, for Goldman Sachs? The culture of public service where people at Goldman Sachs want to give back, I think is a good thing. It's a good thing for our culture. I think it's a good thing for society, and I think it's great that there are competent people uh, like Gary Cohn serving in Washington. David Solomon, great to have you here in San Francisco with us. Thank you.